Good morning and welcome to this, the third in the NASLA webinar series for 2021. My name is Barbara Lemon and I am Executive Officer for National and State Libraries Australia, soon to be National and State Libraries Australasia again as our friends at the National Library of New Zealand uh, will be rejoining the collaboration from July. So great news and a very warm welcome uh, to those joining us today from Aotearoa New Zealand. I'd like to begin, of course, by acknowledging Australia's First Nations peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of the many lands on which we live and work, um, and in my case here in Melbourne, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. So we're here today to talk about artificial intelligence in libraries. I think it's fair to say we all understand the concept uh, of AI, but we may be less familiar with its application in our daily work and in the library sector more broadly. Um, AI, I think, can get caught up in a sort of, um, you know, with sci-fi futuristic connotations that may obscure uh, the, the simpler idea that computational power uh, can be harnessed to make sense of data at a volume and a degree of complexity that is simply uh, beyond human capacity to process. And that power can be used to do all sorts of very exciting things with the data in our care. Um, and of course, it comes with many considerations around risk and ethics. So to demystify some of this for us today, um, we're very lucky to have four excellent speakers. Um, I'll give you a quick introduction today. Uh, before we start with Ingrid. So Ingrid Mason is a data specialist and librarian working with the Australian uh, Data Archive at ANU in Canberra. Uh, she'll be talking about how, hi Ingrid, how the knowledge and uh, expertise of today's librarians is critical for any meaningful use of AI in libraries. Um, a quick intro before you start Ingrid for our other speakers, Rachel Merrick will be next joining us uh, as a from Brisbane as lead for metadata services at the State Library of Queensland. Um, Rachel will be touching on the role of uh, libraries and stewarding all these data rich collections in GLAM institutions uh, so that users of those collections can do creative and wonderful things with them. Kevin Bradley uh, is Assistant Director General for Collections at the National Library of Australia. Uh, he'll be speaking along with Dr. Paul Wong from ANU's 3A Institute in the School of Cybernetics uh, about a new project at the National Library, which sounds very exciting, um, investigating risks and responsibilities in the use of AI and data manipulation. After these three presentations, um, we'll open up to Q&A, so please do make use of the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen throughout the session. As questions um, arise in your mind, pop them there in the Q&A and I'll pick as many of those up as possible in uh, the chat at the end of the, the three presentations. So over to you, Ingrid. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. I'm now going to do that thing where you challenge technology to work for you. Um, and hopefully you can all see um, my slides. So uh, I'd just like to start this talk today um, by acknowledging that I work and live uh, on Ngunnawal land and I would also like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and also to extend a warm welcome to my colleagues in Aotearoa, New Zealand and to say kia ora. So I'm going to talk about librarians uh, in the loop with AI. Um, and I guess uh, to follow on Barbara's note, to give, uh, I hope, a sense of confidence that we have a really important role as a profession to play in this space. And uh, I think we're going to do some terrific things with some of the technologies that AI um, has brackets around. So I'll just start off now. Okay. Bear with me while I get my slides working. Here we go. So I started this talk with that title, Librarians in the Loop with AI, with a specific purpose in mind to kind of subvert that and to rearrange the relationship as one of a feedback. So AI being in the loop with librarians, because we've had a long dialogue with technology in the library profession, and uh, it extends through my entire library career um, and for those who are ahead of me and also um, come behind me as a professional. And I think it's an important um, engagement with technology that uh, we have undertaken and that it brings with it um, change and responsibility. And I'm gonna to touch on that uh, a little because uh, I guess we have to think about how we grapple with this technology. So 
these are my five points. I'm going to talk a little about artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, but we do have Dr. Paul Wong on the line today. So um, aim your pointy questions at him most definitely. Uh, I'm going to talk about where I think we are with AI, and I mean we in the general we, uh, not so much the library community. What I think is needed in libraries and what's in it for me and you um, as librarians and what I or you uh, might do next. And so I'll kick off. Uh, and uh, I guess what I'd like to start with is a definition, um, and I'll just adjust that again, is a definition of AI and machine learning. So I went back to basics and thought, okay, this is a language. This is a language that's come out of the technology domain. It's a specialist and technical language. It's got very pointed terminology. Uh, it deals with technologies and techniques. Um, it's also being used in marketing and sales as a buzzword. Um, and it's, uh, I guess, a domain that's emerged out of uh, different areas of science. And I've just listed three there um, to give a sense of the context for where AI has kind of sprung from. Uh, but I would like to point out to this community that we also have a language, and this really gave me a chuckle. Um, and um, I could have gone on with this list uh, as a reminder that we've been working with data for a long time. And for those of you who are old enough to know what MARC actually stands for, machine readable cataloging, we've been working with machines for quite some time and data. But uh, I think what comes with AI is going to bring about changes uh, at the core of what we do over time. So I will touch a little on that later, but this did make me chuckle. And I hope it reminds you that with every new area of uh, practice and knowledge comes new language, and this is just a new language. So I went to a beginner's guide, to this wonderful person on the internet um, called Ramstri Gutham uh, to help me break down the subject matter because I thought, I really don't understand this. There are all these words that don't resonate for me um, and don't, don't give me a sense of what, what they're about. So I recommend going to look at his Medium post and having a look uh, because it's a really nice breakdown. Um, and there's a table, or oh, there's a hierarchy in there that really broke it down for me nicely. And I don't begin to say that this is, um, you know, the encyclopedia entry for AI. It was a useful breakdown for me in separating machine learning from natural language processing, from computer vision and audition, and robotics and manufacturing and optimization. So this kind of set the higher level for me. And then I was interested in what fell out from that. And so the areas that I have had some interaction with is with natural language processing. And uh, it makes sense that that works with speech and text data. And we know that that's actually what's sitting underneath search engines, driving their ability to predict what it is that you're about to put into that search box. And then with machine learning, um, going down a level to understand that there's such a thing as supervised versus unsupervised learning. And so I was quite curious about that. I thought, what does supervised mean? And what does unsupervised mean? Um, and as I dug in a little bit, I began to understand that supervised meant that you fed information into the machine so that you were guiding its learning as opposed to letting the machine unsupervised do its own pattern detection. So that's a gross oversimplification, but it was useful for me to kind of understand what's going on at that level. And then underneath these categories are, I guess, different types of machine learning, deep learning, decision trees, and clustering. And I'm definitely no expert in this area, but this kind of process was really useful to me to kind of build up my sense of what AI is and was. So where are we with AI? I guess having spent about a year um, looking at this space, um, this is where I've come to. I think we're in a process of reversal, that we're getting quite a bit of pushback from critical thinkers from within that community, the AI community, but also outside of that community. And it's good. It's good pushback because we can see that there are real challenges, um, not just in terms of ethics, but also practical challenges. Um, and I think a correction is already underway. Uh, that community is paying attention to what I've got down at the bottom there. Fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics. And this has also been extended to intelligibility and responsibility. So I'm glad to say that I think there's uh, a response from that community as well to look at what it is um, they're doing and seeing uh, how it can be modified because some problems have arisen. 
So uh, that leads to the third point that there is change coming. Uh, people are paying attention to the impact of AI and its application where it can be useful. So I think this is a good thing, especially for us. And uh, well, it's great to hear about this project from the National Library of Australia because um, learning how to build trust into systems is I think something that we've been doing for quite some time. Perhaps not with AI, but as a profession, we think very much about the trust um, that we have with the constituents that we work for. And so um, I think this is a good space for us to be working in. So these are the areas that I think um, we might uh, work in with regard to library practice that will look to augment what we do. Uh, we'll look to automation to save us time, uh, which might enable us to do new things. We'll look to enhance our collections or our services in some way. We want to be responsive in a way that is potentially automated, which is quite tricky. So I think that's an interesting space. And also potentially AI is gonna help us with decision-making. But I'm reiterating again at the bottom there, how important this community um, is to this application process, bringing in their social consciousness and their thoughts about ethics and maintaining that trust of those that we work for um, and operate on behalf of. So this is what I think is needed from libraries. I think we need, leaders, need to show leadership and social responsibility and action. And I think we've got uh, a lot of the experience, expertise and skills to do this. Um, I think we get very caught up in the computational side of this and the technology side of it. Um, and perhaps don't give as much weight as we could to the strength of that which we have within the community about this, the critical thinking and um, the awareness of this, the effects that we have on others. So I've stolen a slide from a talk from the Bala Tech X, um, that I gave to emphasize areas of what I consider to be glamour expertise and libraries fit in here. We've got the more technical side of things to the left, but to the right are the more social side of things. And so I think this community has an enormous contribution to make to dealing with some, with some of the challenges of AI um, and uh, not just the technical ones, but the social challenges. So what I think is needed in libraries is I think we're going to have to grapple with what this means for us as an occupation, how this is gonna change our practice, whether our skills need to be adjusted a bit and how technology is going to perhaps play a more central role in what it is that we do. So I picked this um, quote up from the ABC News and I thought, isn't this interesting that uh, the government has recognised um, and wants to set up an academy to train staff in the Australian public service in areas of data analysis, digital skills and management. And I think a lot of those skills actually already exist in the library community. So I'm very intrigued to see where this um, agenda goes and whether there will be opportunities to pick up some extra skills for those who work um, in libraries uh, in the federal level. But what about me and what about you? What's in it for me and what's in it for you? I think uh, when, whenever we have a burst of technology, it can often cause anxiety, both excitement and anxiety. So I've put feelings down the bottom there because I think it provokes a lot of feelings and it certainly provoked a lot of feelings in me. Um, it made me think about what I already know about technology and what I don't know. And that left me in a bit of a quandary. So I had a little cloud above my head and I thought, what do I do about this? What do I do about not knowing about this technology? So I've already said I started to kind of scratch away at some of the basics. But I did want to think about how I go from being unclear about what this meant to being in a position where I felt clearer and I felt empowered to be able to do something constructive, both as a professional, but also as a colleague. Um, so this is what I've done. I've spent a bit of money and a bit of my own time to do a bit of professional development. And that's my choice. It might not be the right choice for you, but it was the choice I made because I thought, actually, I've always been obsessed with metadata and that's not going to change. So I think I need to take a deep breath and just keep going because I think this is the right path for me. But the path for you might be slightly different. But what this set me off on, given this talk today, is where analytical thinking fits. And I've pinched these two quotes from a website, which I won't tell you about just immediately. But I thought, um, this is a really core skill in the library community. We use that thinking to do um, the kinds of uh, work 
around change. We need to change our services or change our collections. We also do that work when we're actually analysing the patterns of activity in our organisations to help us think about what to do. So analytical thinking is actually right at the centre of what we do. And so I thought, okay, this relates to needs analysis. You need to be a problem solver, have good communication, be able to allocate resources. These are all kind of terms that we see in the job descriptions that we have. And they kind of fit in both descriptions. So for those of you who've already guessed, um, but for those of you who haven't, these are descriptions of a business analyst and a data analyst. And I think that many in the library community have a little bit of both of that in some of the jobs that they do already. And this contributes to the work that we do in the library community with collection services and technology. So this was pinched from the UNSW site, uh, which is where I've done my postgrad uh, study. And uh, what I think is interesting here is uh, the emphasis that is placed on communication skills and how vital that is uh, in an organizational context and also deep knowledge of the nature of the organization that you're working in. And I would say that ticks both boxes for the library community. Um, but I did go away and do a bit of digging because I thought, so where do these data analysts and data scientists fit? I went to the ABS site and looked up occupation codes and uh, you see the blue line there, it's pretty, pretty stable. But then the green line and the red line, they are different kind of analysts in organizational contexts. So I thought, okay, that's where some of the business analysts and data analysts, where that's very central to their role might sit. But then I added a couple more categories in there uh, where I thought this is probably where data scientists and data analysts sit more clearly. And so it made me think a lot and it made me think, I'm not so sure that some of these analytical skills are well reflected in the description of our occupation. I think what's clear is that there's been a growth and need for this uh, in the wider uh, community, but I'm not so sure uh, that's well reflected in descriptions of our, our profession as an occupation. But I'm delighted to see that big upswing there because it says analytical thinking is really important. So the question is, where will these new skills and processes fit? And so I thought, what options do we have? We can build in generalist analytics positions. We could have a business analyst or a data analyst added to a library, um, or you can uh, extend those skills that already exist in the organization, or you can outsource, buy them in. Uh, you can build up that expertise around ethics in-house. I'm pretty confident that you can't outsource that. That's a pretty core part of what we do as librarians. But there is actually, I think, a specialist analytics position that will emerge. And I think that's pretty exciting for those of us who are continue to be obsessed with material culture and being a librarian. But there's also opportunities to work with people who have complementary skills uh, in cross-functional teams. And I think all of the above are potentially relevant for this community. So I just wanted to touch on that idea of what is special for us in this world of analytics and analytical thinking. So I've pinched uh, a quote from a, a journal article that's coming out um, sometime later this year that I co-wrote with Sarah Kennedyne and Lily Hibbard because I think curatorial analytics is going to emerge from the collecting community. And I think um, as I've described there, that it is a really different kind of engagement with collections. And I'm both very excited and provoked by that idea. Um, from a technological point of view, it makes me think a lot about the kind of underlying infrastructure that you have to support collections and the relationship between collections and technology. But I think it's a really exciting space. And I don't think we'll get there in five minutes, but it does give me heart to think that there will be something that we bring to this uh, idea of computation with our ideas about interpretation and representation and significance and heritage. And I'm really um, energized by that idea. So what can I or you do next? I think Continue to be curious and ready and open as you are because you've come along to this talk today or you're going to listen afterwards. I reflected and thought over a lifetime of being a librarian, I stacked up a list of different technologies that I'd encountered along with everybody else at that time. 
in my career. And the latest one at the top is artificial intelligence. But I started working with technology from the day I started being a library assistant. And I think um, in some ways we forget that it's a really core part of what we do and that we've been working with it and testing it and evaluating and developing technology for a long time. So this is, I guess, my reaffirmation that I think we have an important role to play in terms of social responsibility and action. And as a next step, it's possible to go and have a look at the earlier submission to the Data61 Ethics Framework. It's a really um, nice, neat submission. There's the actual framework itself you can have a look at. And the Australian College of Learned Academies have also written a Horizon Scan report on AI and um, what needs to happen. So uh, I'll finish off with saying I invite you to join the AI for Lamb community, Artificial Intelligence for and by Libraries, Archives and Museums. It's a movement that has been pushed off by our colleagues in the Northern Hemisphere. And um, I'd like to acknowledge a number of people who um, helped stand a regional chapter up. We have an Australian and New Zealand chapter and we'd love to have more people involved. Um, it's a very informal but um, active community of people. And I think with that, I'll just say thanks to the Australian Data Archive for releasing me for a little uh, part of the day and um, hand it back to you, Barbara. Thank you so much, Ingrid, and thanks for giving us your time today um, so generously as well. I think really helpful there to have it articulated, you know, that AI can help us with specifically uh, those concepts like augmentation, enhancement, automation, responsive design, and so on. And just that reminder that we may have more skills uh, relevant to this than we realise, and having a look at what skills we might like to develop, really interested in the idea of uh, curatorial analytics uh, as a, a field to watch or a potential position to watch for future. So thanks so much. Um, I will hand over to Rachel Merrick to tell us a little bit more about what AI can help library users do. Hello, everybody. Just give me a minute to share my screen. Okay, so I want to talk about stewarding data rich collections for use and reuse. Um, and I should say I'm at the State Library of Queensland, which is in Brisbane, which is Turable and Yagara country. Um, I'm just recently the lead of metadata services there, but I've been working with our digital library initiative team for a few years. And so I wanted to talk about machine learning and AI from this perspective we've taken at State Library of like what can we practically do now? How can we be involved in this space um, with the skills and tools that we have? And I think a lot of what this draws on comes down to collections as data, which we talk about a lot in the library community um, because this is really transforming the way that we think about collections. So one of the offers we have at libraries and other GLAM institutions is massive historical and also modern collections and their physical, they're digitized, they're born digital, but we need to think about that in the sense that all digital content, regardless of where it started, is ones and zeros, so that is data. So whether it's a photo, a document, a map, that is all actually data that can be harvested and harnessed and reused. So I think we work really well at libraries sitting in a space where we can cultivate collections as data and then be a sort of middleman for our diverse users and experts who can do really interesting machine learning and artificial intelligence projects with it. So the first step is we need to uncover that data in our collections. So one thing that I think is really easy and straightforward is when you say, you know, a register or an index, this would be a database if they made it today. So that's a really easy translation for us um, to structure and put out there for people to reuse. But we also have heaps of geospatial and chronological information in our collections. So we can map things over space and time um, and give people new entryways into our collections. There's also a lot of work that can be done with named entities. So that's talking about how we as librarians use our skills with you know, authorities and subjects. We're identifying persons, places, and things, and then those can be connected within and between our collections. Um, so you might think about it like, 
at State Library, maybe we have a diary in our manuscripts collection from a famous politician, but we also have a photo of the house that he grew up in. And we can see an estate map where that land was sold. And we can link that also to a journal that he contributed articles to. And in a traditional sense, those are all sitting separately. But when you think of this as just all of our collections as data that we can, can be connected together, um, it gives a lot more opportunities to remix use of our collections. And there's also interesting opportunities you can explore with new technologies like using image recognition across our undescribed images to try and draw out more information for users or playing with auto transcription of our diaries, vectorizing maps so that instead of it just being this 2D image, something that could sit across Google Earth and be really interactive. But I want people to think really creatively about data. Um, because we can really find it in places that you wouldn't traditionally think of. And an example here is the Tunley Globe, which was a Braille globe invented in Queensland in the 1950s. And when you think of just a physical object, you think, well, what data is in this? But we use 3D capture techniques to create a printed replica. So users can come into the library and see this printed replica and play with it. But we also have made freely available the digital models, the 3D models online, so you can move it around and play with it from your computer, but you can also download the printable high resolution files so that you could print this yourself. So it's just something that I want us to think differently about collections and where is the data and where can we find it and where can it be useful. So once we've uncovered that data, the next step is how do you make it more usable? And the key, one of the key components of our digital strategy at State Library is to build our collections for use and reuse. And we're a really data rich agency in that we have heaps of these collections, but we also have a lot of internal data. And so we've been uploading open data to government data portals for almost 10 years. So we have quite a robust open data program. Um, and we've been doing maturity assessments on that every year to see, you know, how can we improve what we're doing? How can we make this data more available? How can we encourage people to build things with it and do cool machine learning projects with our unique offer? And so you might have heard of Sir Tim Berners-Lee's five-star model for linked open data. This is what sort of guides our approach to how we make our data more usable at State Library. So the first star is pretty straightforward. Is it freely available and reusable? So we put it online, people have permission to use it. That's great, that's one star. The next star is to have it in a machine readable structure. So think of this like, instead of just a Word document or a text file that has a bunch of dump of characters, having it in a tabular spreadsheet that a machine is able to use that is structured and consistent. The third star is if that's then open source. So you put it in a CSV file instead of making someone pay for a Microsoft Office um, license to be able to use Excel. And this one we already know all about in libraries. The fourth star is using open standards and schemas. So it's the same as using MARC or any other you know, XML standard for how we structure our data and our data sets. We want other people to be able to use it easily and reuse it and for applications to use it really quickly and easily. And the fifth star, which is harder, which is much cooler, and we want to move more in this space, is actually linking that data to other data. And ideally, you want to do this in a dynamic sense where there could be a linked data platform. And then you're not just in your own silo of your data sets, but you're connected to information around the world and people can reuse that. So this is what our open data portal looks like, the Queensland government open data portal. Um, and we have loaded up on their information in CSVs. We use internal schemas for our data sets and those are local and national and international standards. But the really cool thing about this is that not only can a human go in and download these files and play with them and use them, but it has API access. So anyone can build an application, um, a mobile app, you know, any sort of technology that can harness that API, and then they can take our data automatically and dynamically, even as we add more to it. And so this is where those schemas become really important because we have one data set about our catalog searches that has hundreds of files in it. So you can imagine if someone's built an app and they have to readjust it for every different file, it would be incredibly frustrating. Uh, the cool thing about this also is that the Queensland government 
open data portal is harvested by the federal government open data portal, so it can be found there. But it's also harvested by Google data set search. So there we're sitting alongside literally thousands of other data repositories so that people can find our data without even having to be funneled through, I guess, these narrower windows of people who know where the data is. So once we've uncovered the data, we've made it more usable and structured. The whole goal for us at State Library is, again, to create these connected, rich digital experiences. The reason we have the collections out there and the reason we're putting effort in to make them data is because we want, we want our users to, to create something, to create something new. And we are trying to kickstart that by showing the way with some projects to harness what we have. So one example is Unstacked. So visualizing is a really great way for people with entry-level digital skills to still explore and benefit from collections as data. And this uses our metadata about our collections and their thumbnail representations to create a live or semi-live visual feed of what people are clicking on in our collections right now within our catalog. Um, and it brings to the front things that people are interested in. It exposes um, catalog items that others might not know are there. For a bit more of an advanced user, we also participate in the GovHack Hackathon. And so this is run every year. And basically we can set challenges for people to use our data to create something um, within the scope of what we set and they, they can win a prize. So this was our winner in 2019, it's called My Place. And it's an app, a mobile app that uses our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander language data sets. And basically it locates you based on your GPS location on your phone. And then it uses virtual reality to see yourself in the space. If you look at the map mode, it also uses augmented reality so that you can uh, get translations and information about different things you're looking at on your phone. And it also connects to stories and collections from the community, which is very cool. So from our data being available, um, it's created this app or prototype of an app that is promoting participation in preservation of the valuable at-risk languages. And that wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't made the information freely available. Because one of the things I think we need to remember as libraries is when someone's experimenting and playing around and trying to figure out what they wanna develop, we don't want to make it hard for them to find the data for them to play with because they need to know what they want from us if they're going to work hard for it. And instead, we just want to put it all out there and make it easy to use. And trying to move in that link data space again, that five stars, um, we have a public library directory on our website, which is just a treasure trove of data. So it has all the public libraries in Queensland, they're geolocated and has information about them. Um, and you can go to the library or the library's website, you can search that and find what you're looking for. But now we're taking it and connecting it in a linked data platform. So if you've heard of Wikidata or if you haven't, it's the knowledge-based database that sits behind all the Wikimedia Foundation products. So that's Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons for Images. And it's basically structured in just a series of facts. So you would say the Gladstone City Library is located at X coordinates. And because it's in that structured format and it's, it's in a, a linked data standard that other machines can jump into, it means that anyone can reuse this information and repackage it and access it in new ways. And it, you can do really great visualizations as well. So this is a quick query that we've done, which is just saying map all our public libraries in Queensland, group them by and color them by their library service. But you can do almost anything. You can come up with your own query. You can connect other information that isn't from state library and Wikidata. So you can say, I wanna run a query to see all of the public libraries that are within two kilometers of a public school, or I wanna see all the libraries that are sitting on Kookaburra Street. And you know whether or not that exists, you can see sort of the almost endless possibilities that can be reused when people have access to query our information this way. And so that next step, um, we're calling empowering digital experimentation. So how can we, get large scale collections of data projects that draw on bigger, broad, broader outcomes with our data. 
And so in 2020, we ran our inaugural Digital Collections Catalyst initiative. And the idea of this was to put a call out for highly creative and experimental ideas that support innovative uses of our collections and data. And this could be creatives, technologists, archivists, librarians, anyone who could prove that they're able to complete their project. And it was intentionally open-ended and broad. We weren't commissioning a project from someone. We were saying, what can you do with our data? Here's our data. What is a, a broad scale idea? And essentially to bring together that technology with cultural heritage. So our successful applicant was Dr. Kia Weinsmith, who hopefully you can hear talk next week at the AI for Lamb uh, webinar. And his project was called Mapping Future Brisbane. And essentially it was looking at how can maps of Brisbane's past be used to inform its possible futures? So we have massive collections of digitized maps at State Library, but we also, or Kier was also able to connect to collections you know, around the country that are looking at Brisbane. And the cool thing about maps is you might think of them just as an image, but they, each one is a representation of Brisbane's past at a different point in time. And it also is a detailed data repository of change. So you can see, how new roads were developed, how you know, road names changed, how topography changed, um, you know, when the ECA came in, all sorts of information. And it's representing that space in history in a data model that then makes it an input for machine learning. And so this is a, a cool visual that Kier made where you can see the different ways that something might be mapped, whether it's color or layout or design, but anchoring it around that the Brisbane River and how you can then have that, that anchor point for his, his I guess, visual prep, uh, preps for the machine learning algorithm that can then help it use the data. So after he did his research into Brisbane's history, which I should say, wasn't just looking at maps, but was walking around Brisbane, was talking to experts, talking to indigenous and non-indigenous people. Um, he then is using these maps to predict Brisbane's future. But the interesting thing is this prediction is based on how it changed in the past. So it's sort of linear. And if you look at how all of the, the maps fed into the machine learning algorithm, if that could accurately predict the present, then you know that you're on the right track. So he used that with population projections from the ABS saying, saying, we know this many people are gonna to need to fit into Brisbane based on these projections. And then you make machine dreams. And I like that terminology because it also implies to the users that these aren't facts. It's not just a machine spitting out facts. It's all based on what was input and input has bias from the person and from the algorithm but it came up with some really cool outcomes. So these are more of the arty visual side where we're comparing it to the previous image. And you can see how each image isn't drastically different because they're all fed on the same um, histories of Brisbane that had similar roads, but how the machine learning algorithm played with that to look at what Brisbane's futures could be. And so then after that, you get to the engagement point, which is again, why we're doing all of this. So Kier developed a 3D interactive tool with a company called Giraffe, um, or used one of their tools to twerk it for his, um, his project. And basically we were asking users, here's what the machine learning technology has spit out and said, this is future Brisbane. Do you disagree? What does your future Brisbane look like? The power is now in your hands so that you can sort of adjust and make your own future Brisbane. So just real quickly, I will, Ooh. here we go. This is what it looks like. So basically you can zoom in and scroll around and these orange buildings are the projected change. And so basically right now, Brisbane has a lot of density right in the CBD, but then you can go out one suburb and see that it's really flat. So if we continue to change like that, this is what Brisbane will look like. But as a user, you could say, well, I don't really agree with that. I don't think that South Brisbane should have all these big buildings. Um, I'm gonna change the density. Well, you could make it even bigger, have a super city, or you can try and space out growth and density. So it goes out throughout all the inner suburbs. Um, so it just lets people sort of change the narrative around what will happen. It also, one of the things we, that he did at the beginning was a survey talking about 
what, what do people care about? What do they think that this machine learning algorithm should take into account? And everybody talked about green space and parts. So he also has a tool where you can come in and say, you know what, I've decided that all of West End should just be a park. And so then they can draw in their own park and say, this is my future Brisbane. That's what it's going to look like. And then another cool thing is because we're libraries and we love um, hearing what, what people think about future Brisbane and we wanna save it to our collections, people had the option to save their map, save their image of it. They could share it, they could print it out, they could add it to state libraries collection, which we've done. And let me go back. So it was really about engaging users in that future thinking, um, but also in what is machine learning? What does it mean? It's already affecting our lives and understanding that it is biased and it can be fed in with bias based in the collections, but it's also getting people to think about our library collections and data and how they can use it in these new technologies. And I think this is really the interesting space that we can be working in as, as if you're a librarian who doesn't already have the skills to make you know, an artificial intelligence project yourself. We are the experts at the data and the collections, so we can have that information out there to partner with someone who is able to do it. And this is an example of the map that you could print out and hang on your wall. Um, but so this is that role as data steward summarized because all of this was possible for Akira's project based on how we handled collections. So we uncovered data in our maps, we made it structured and reusable, and then we, we created opportunities for people to experiment with machine learning and create a rich digital experience. So I think you don't need to feel like you have to do it all yourself as a librarian. If you can understand the space and understand how your skills can fit into it, um, at least at State Library, this is where we've been going so far and we're excited to keep using our collections as data in this space. So that's it for me. Beautiful, Rachel. Thank you so much. And I think that was a really effective uh, sort of visualisation um, of what's possible for libraries using AI and perhaps more importantly, why, why we would do it, which is all about, of course, engagement with um, library users tapping into collections. I think an important message there too, that we don't have to do it all alone. And that five star model is really helpful. Um, <clears throat> I think libraries are often falling at the first hurdle in the sense of cleaning up data or the great big task of cleaning up data ready for projects like this and of course uh, leading to that tricky fifth star about linking it and perhaps that's where the, the partnerships really come in. So thank you for that beautiful presentation. We'll come back to you in question time, um, which is a nice segue to remind everybody to please pop your questions into the, the Q&A box so that we can come back to those. We've got plenty of time to talk through your questions at the end of the session. Um, for now, uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Kevin Bradley and Paul Wong. Hey, I'm Kevin Bradley. I'm Assistant Director General at the National Library. Um, and I hope I'm appearing on your screens. I can't quite tell from here. Um, but as I um, look out the window, I can see uh, the Brindabellas in the distance and Mount Ainslet behind me, which tells me I'm on Ngunnawal land. And I'd just like to acknowledge that as I uh, begin our conversations. So like many in the library and the information community, uh, the National Library of Australia has been dabbling at the edges of machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence and intelligent data manipulation. When I say AI or artificial intelligence, I'm thinking of all those things together. Um, and it promises so much. AI promises so much to those of us who want to manage them and provide access to large amounts of information. It could save us vast amounts of time in organising and managing our collections and its seemingly magical capability of making order out of chaos, of finding that relevant piece of information in a vast field of disorganised data, made many of us wonder if we still needed the standard systems and structures that we'd relied on in our professions for so many years, and uh, which both Rachel and Ingrid talked about. Um, National Library, as you're probably aware, recently reorganised its workforce in order to align it with modern collecting practices and the processes that underpin them. And in that reorganization, we made a lot of assumptions about what work we thought we could automate, what tedious tasks could be more made more efficient, and how by using the emerging AI technologies, 
our highly capable and professional staff could concentrate on doing those things that required real or human intelligence. However, before we went deeper than just dabbling at the edges and potentially ending up, ending up over our heads, just to stretch the analogy right out, uh, we thought we'd better investigate what we thought of as ethics associated with AI. Now, the things we imagined we could use from AI, and I, I think in some ways, perhaps a little differently, I'm thinking about the back end. So what things we imagined we could use for AI includes creating catalog records, reading text, turning speech to text, searching content in our collection, harvesting data to synthesize records. We have plans to increase our use of these technologies, creating summaries of content automatically, searching collections in non-textual ways, delivering content to users based on preferences, and much more which we could barely articulate. Uh, so the, though their back end, and some of those were front end tasks, but most of those were the back end tasks, everything you do in a library ends up being measured on its impact on users of both the tools they use as well as the tools we use and what it means for people who use um, our collections. We had, like most modern libraries, been involved with many of these new areas already, collecting large quantities of complicated data in all types of formats and finding new ways to describe, analyse and provide access to it. Uh, because that's the world both our users, we and our content exists. What we haven't done is explored what the impact is on our users. What are the ethical concerns? I feel like going ethical concerns. Um, what are the ethical concerns in using such technologies? Uh, what are the pitfalls to our new approaches and how we might address them? And I'll just talk about three things that we've done a bit of um, work on with our AI. One was um, around transcription and voice recognition. So our oral history collection has had a, an audio delivery system for the past uh, 10 or 15 years that links the audio to places um, in the, or at least the transcript to places in the audio. So uh, you could search for a word and the sound of that word or whatever it is you're searching for would play after the search. So it's a, it's a way of getting into non-textual materials. However, to do it, we've had to have either a transcript or a summary of that item with a, um, a coded link along the sorts of um, structures and standards we use for many things that allows us to find that place in there. And it costs us a lot of money to make transcripts and um, it costs a lot of people a lot of time to do summaries. So we thought, what if we could do that automatically? Um, and with a, um, a colleague from uh, Kentucky University, we looked at uh, uh, what voice recognition would do. And the accuracy is very high. Um, we found if you've got the right system, even with our terrible Australian accents, people could recognise what we were saying um, and transcribe them in these sorts of systems up to about you know, 96%, 97% accuracy, which is phenomenal. But what happens if we said to ourselves, if that word was the critical word, the one word that changes the meaning, if it said did instead of didn't, or you know, along that sort of line, is that an ethical issue for us? Um, and it made us concerned about the way we represent that data. Then we thought about image recognition. We use image recognition um, to, and it's quite available. We use it in Google all the time. We can sort of get a search for an image like this. But if we used it to actually recognise what we're looking at, what would we be presenting? If would we be presenting a particular view of that person, landscape, object, whatever that was embedded into it. So we thought, is that an ethical issue? Um, and then we, we also looked at um, perhaps another issue on it is um, we've been looking at um, doing better correcting, you know, machine learning correction of our OCR newspaper collections. You know, with, it's a, um, all of our, our NASLA libraries involved in Trove know that the uh, newspaper correction is a phenomenal uh, amount of support that we get uh, but we thought, what if we use the data that they've created by correcting newspapers to improve our corrections of newspapers? Um, and we thought about the same with transcription and voice recognition. Uh, but in fact, the major systems that do this sort of work tend not to give us the ability to train it ourselves, but train it on larger data sets well, elsewhere. Would that present an ethical issue for us? And so we, we were concerned 
at the risks of building into our system and technologies the types of biases that we strive to avoid in our manual work, uh, but have not codified that thinking in to help inform our decision making and indeed that of the library community. So we took our problem to the School of Cybernetics, um, the 3AI Institute in the School of Cybernetics at the ANU, and whose motto is keeping humanity and technology, how could you not love that, um, in order to say, what can we, what sort of project can we come up with to uh, work through these sorts of issues? Uh, and the first kind of conversation that we had, Genevieve Bell, who heads the 3AI Institute, uh, very cogently explained to me that I was not dealing with ethics in any timely sense, but rather all scenarios I can think of were ethical dilemmas that existed, whether I was talking about potential catalog records created by artificial intelligence or catalog records created by humans that reflected their biases. And I'm sure um, you, like us, can find many examples in our collections of very biased records that we're embarrassed, embarrassed to see are still there. Um, ones that came from our pre-enlightened days, um, last week um, or last decade or whenever. Um, so the, the, the phrase I took from it was AI amplifies issues. It doesn't create ethical dilemmas, it amplifies ethical dilemmas. Ethics itself, is a moving target, but ethical dilemmas are something we need to make a call on to look at what are our responsibilities to address them, what are our risks in management. The issue still exists, it always has. Um, even the standards that we talked about, the library standards that we talked about are culturally embedded. They represent the biases of the people who created them and we've been using those for a long, long time. Um, but nonetheless, they have embedded them. Um, the views of the time, uh, which are different to the views that we have now. So again, what are our risks? What are our responsibilities? So we developed a, an idea for a project with the three AI and um, Paul Wong, who is here with me, Dr. Paul Wong here with me, uh, is leading, uh, leading this in, uh, investigation and we're hoping to produce a report on it over the next uh, couple of months. Um, so I'll hand over to Paul and he can talk to you a bit about the, uh, the first steps we're taking and thinking about how we address some of the issues we've been raising. i just pop my head over here. So oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Uh, let me just, just also start by acknowledging that, that we are at the land of the Nanua and Nambi people and pay our collective respects to uh, elders past, present and futures. Having said that, I, let me just sort of set some context uh, to, uh, to the conversations. We felt particularly honored uh, that, that the National Library approached us to have this conversation, partly because we are also from a national <laughs> institution, uh, the Australian National University. Both institutions have, um, is under a, a piece of legislation, have responsibilities to the Australian people to deliver benefits. So, so we feel particularly honored that, that, that um, uh, Kevin came to us to have these conversations. Um, let me just start by, by um, articulating what is cybernetics. I think that, that will set the, set the context right. Uh, cybernetics has been around since the 50s. Uh, it's the ultimate, what I call, in relational thinking. So we tend to think of cybernetics as focusing on not just indi individual things, a piece of technologies all by itself, but trying to get at the relationship between the technologies and other pieces and other components of a system. So ultimately in relational thinking, thinking about technologies as, as part of a component of a broader system. And we, we do think that libraries in general are systems in that sense, have many moving different components in it. And it's quite complex as, as libraries evolve over time. The second aspect of cybernetics is, is that we take the notion of diversity seriously because we recognize that the, the more complex a system, the more diverse the system's components and the internet interactions got to be. So diversity is, is an important aspect to understand systems. The third element and this key element is, is the feedback and communication mechanisms within systems. Um, and this also brings to the the, the fourth element is the particular kind of time scale in operations with respect to feedback mechanisms. Some feedback me mechanism is very direct. You get the 
immediate feedback when you perform a certain actions, you know what the consequence is. We are very impressed in terms of the National Library's thinking, in terms of the long time scale thinking that it needs to, because it is collecting collections now for the futures, not just tomorrow, not just the next year, but 50 years from now. So, and as you as you're fully aware, the further out you look into the future, the more difficult it is that you anticipate what that future looks like. And therefore, the decision that you make now are the more challenging. So these are these are all the kind of four elements that underpin cybernetic thinking. Oh, uh, on the matter of scales too, uh, is not just time scale. We have heard about. Um, the deluge of, of, of uh, data, the volume of, of data that, that library, uh, libraries are swamped with. So the, the, another dimension of that scale is the volume of, of data that is coming through the systems. So scale has multiple kind of dimension to it. Um, so having said, just kind of lay the ground of what cybernetic thinking is. So I'm going to just sketch out um, the kind of if you may call it a framework or, or analytical thinking that, that underpins what, how we could approach this project. Although the focus point here is to think through technologies, but it's very important for us to get back to that relational thinking. That is, technology doesn't exist in a vacuum by itself. Now, I know that, that some of my colleagues in computer science like to put the technologies in the lab and run experiment over it and, and get a lot of nice statistics. And, you know, people do that in, in engineering discipline. You know, they put the car in the lab, smash it up, understand its safety in that way. That's perfectly legitimate, a good way to understand technologies. But we are thinking of technologies in terms of its relationship in an organization, in a, in a system sense. So there are five elements that, that I think, five elements or center of gravity, if you, if, you, if you wish, that I think are, are, are important for us to think through when it comes to technologies. First and foremost is people. I think technology is here to serve people. And also the technologies themselves are designed and invented by people. So the people element is one of the core elements that we need to think through in terms of the interactions between the technologies and the people. People not just in the sense of the end user or the audience or the reader of library, but also internal staff of the library. Because if the technology breaks, someone has to fix it. Who is going to fix it, right? Um, the second element is the processes. So processes are step by step kind of procedures in which you do things in order to achieve outcomes in our organizations. Once again, technologies need to have some process in place in order to coordinate those activities. Uh, so the second element is processes. The third element is that obvious because we, uh, library is so data intensive and the technologies that we're focusing on is all about various way that we process, manipulate, uh, create value out of data. Uh, and by data, I don't just mean born digital, but also those born physical and born biological. Uh, machine learning worked on digital data, but there's still a, a, a way to go from, this is a physical bit of, of matter, and we need to actually turn it into something digital that we can apply machine learning. So uh, we need to think about that pipeline how do we convert these physical into digital form that now enable us to uh, exploit uh, machine learning to do what we need to do. Uh, the fourth element is what I call infrastructure. Infrastructure is a funny, funny thing because it's, you need it in order to, to run your tech, your, your software. Every piece of software has to run on an operating system and the operating system has to be supported by the organization somewhere. So the infrastructure, and, and sometimes the software has to be connected to the network. So these are all things that, that are typically hidden from the user, but when it breaks, it come back to you and say, how can I fix it? And the last piece is um, the context of the, um, of the system. The context of the systems are all the bits and pieces of the environment that can shape and change 
what a library needs to do. Anything from there is a change in the privacy policies, regulations. Now the library need to actually put in place a set of uh, policies to honor those legislations. Uh, to there is a funding cut. So again, you know, that will have flow on effect. So any of these kind of environmental factors that has flow on effect that are typically not under the con control of the libraries has to be part of the considerations when, when we are thinking about tech. as simple as the technologies, when some technology, when it gets cheap enough, that is now made available commercially for the library to use, that's a context, that's a commercial context that, that the library need to think about. So having laid out those five things, I think it's pretty, I hope it's pretty clear to everyone that, that when, we are, when we're doing piece of analysis, we're not just look, looking at the technical aspect of, the, of the technologies, but trying to really get some deep understanding of the relational, the kind of interaction between these five things. And you may find that it's not just a, uh, sometimes you need to actually look at a tripartite relationship between the people and the technologies and the, and the data and the process or at the same time, and you can't just isolate one without talking about the other. Uh, other times you may take a more focused approach and, and just look at how the technologies are interacting with, with the data. Um, now, getting back a little bit back, back about the long-term thinking, I think it's really important for us to, in this project to lay out a framework that is reusable. Because as you know, technology change over time. So five years from now, there'll be a different set of technology. Uh, machine learning will develop into a next stage. What we want to do in this uh, piece of work is to develop a framework that is reusable so that in five years times, we can utilize that framework to help the library to think through what it needs to do in order to adopt uh, new technologies five years or 10 years from now. So um, having said that, uh, I think I pause for a while. Do, do you have a uh, reaction to what I just said? I think. <laughs> Other than to say, well said, Paul. No, I don't. So um, we'll hand back um, to questions, I think. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin and Paul. That's terrific. And uh, I will invite all the speakers to, to switch their videos on for this sort of Q&A component of the session. Um, some great sort of reminders there um, from both Paul and Kevin about sort of ethical analysis involving relationships between multiple systems and people and processes and guidelines and all those things that we love. Um, and, and not sort of baking in our own biases, our own prejudices to the technologies that we're using, um, technologies really being there for for people. Um, and I like that, Kevin, about uh, AI amplifying ethical dilemmas rather than sort of creating new ones, as it were. Um, we have a couple of questions popping up through Q&A. And Rachel, I might direct the first one to you. You had a beautiful comment um, right at the start about all digital content is ones and zeros, and um, that this kind of gives us new entryways to our collections. Um, there's a question here about so many um, decisions coming down to client demand when it comes to mm -hmm. taking on these activities and have have you in this case uh, identified any trends in AI applications that clients are crying out for? That's an interesting question. I would say no, but I think internally there's a lot of demand for how AI can help us with our processes, with our description, um, especially for all these massive historical collections like images that maybe haven't been described. Um, but I'm not totally sold on, on how those systems would work. And, and I think it would be really important that, again, we have that clarity for users of, you know, these are tags created by machine learning, not by humans, because we can't be across everything. In terms of clients, um, I mean, I think in a very vague sense, our clients really engage with new cool projects that help them explore collections in a new way, which I know is vague, but almost by definition, it's like the, the, the shininess of it when you have something new and they go, oh, and then suddenly they're exploring through the map collection that they'd never really looked at before. So I think playing in that space is somewhere that we want to keep exploring. Um, and I'd love to find 
or experiment with some some back end products that could help us, I, I guess, be more efficient uh, in the way that we're presenting our information to clients while also being really careful about exactly uh, what decisions are being made in that space. And I guess it's that classic thing of the more people are exposed to um, projects that are underway, the more ideas are generated about what could happen. Hmm. I thought um, I might direct um, to you, Kevin, a, a general question for, for panelists about what your, what your biggest hope and biggest fear is around using AI in libraries. Well, our biggest hope that it'll all work brilliantly and the library will work fantastically and we'll be able to focus our attention on all the things we need to do. Uh, that's a very glib answer, but <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, um, the... Um, my focus has been uh, very much on the processing systems. I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by the discovery things we can do with it as well. But my, at the moment, my, my focus and my thinking is about what can we do uh, to make all the work we have to do as a library to bring the data in, to organise it, to describe it, to create um, order out of that um, chaos in a way that takes advantage of AI. So... Um, I was thinking as we were talking about the, the systems, you know, what tagging does in a, in a piece of metadata you have in there, the information that is for the item itself, then you have the information about it, and then you have some context information. So, um, and it's mostly to allow the dumb machine to distinguish between the parts in the, in the record, to be able to look at the parts in the record and say, okay, this I display, this I know was actually an interaction, this is about, you know, the, the process and whatever. Um, and it takes people a lot of time generally to create that. And if, um, if AI can learn to distinguish between those characteristics of the information, um, then we take away that need to actually code and tag things in that particular way. I mean, people can still do it, but what I'm saying is it takes away the need to create a standard set of tagging or structures with it. Um, and the same with... Uh, summarising content, one of the things that we've been doing largely is providing um, um, the ability to search content. So, uh, you know, up till now, the catalogue record has served to stand in for the item itself. When we have a digital item, we can say make it possible to search the item rather than the catalogue record that we have. Uh, but that, in fact, there's a lot of meaning that's gained out of summarising or creating that. So um, how, do we, how do we draw from something large, a small uh, essence that tells us why it's significant. And I'm certainly thinking that AI will have a lot of capabilities in summarising and creating meaning that will allow people to know where they need to look for things to find out more. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading something the other day that said they'll read the books for us and we won't have to. I don't think that's quite the case, but nonetheless that we can find our way into, into things because we haven't just found a key word, but we've found the essence of meaning. Paul, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I, I do have some fear. I was going to ask Come you about across. fears, okay. Paul, yeah. yeah. Kevin is an optimist. So I'll be the pessimist. Paul, <laughs> um, well, such when, a good team. Yeah, when, when you describe that to some of the technology that, that you trial has, has 96, 97% accurate, uh, that's phenomenal. And, and then you, you backpedal a bit and say, well, what happened to that 3% of mistakes? Is that important mistake? Mm. And, and I like to put a twist to that. If you think, think about uh, the, the advantage of automation is that you can push for a large volumes of data through the system. So you know, instead of maybe um, you know, uh, creating a thousand records in, in a month, you, you now can do 10,000 or 20,000 hour, hour, hour many and maybe a million records in, in, in yeah. And if you think about 97% accuracy of a million records, means that, that you you have uh, 30,000 uh, mistakes <laughs> in, in it. So it, it depends on how you see it. That also means that, that having that speed of delivery of the system also mean that you're pushing mistakes out faster than before. So it depends on how, how you, you view these things. It may be something that you need to think about a little bit mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed. 
beautifully said. There's a question here about collaboration across um, NASLA libraries, which is an excellent question. And I think probably the short answer is we're in baby stages of collaborating when it comes to AI, simply because uh, the members of NASLA are at very different stages of investigating and adopting um, AI technologies, but it's very much um, a current topic for us. And I think that might be um, a question I could direct to Ingrid about the um, potential for collaboration across the sector uh, through AI for Lamb and the appetite for collaboration, the readiness for collaboration. Okay. Um, I was going to have a go at the hope and fear question. Oh, please do um, as well. But um, <laughs> uh, I guess uh, I just want to drop in. I share Paul's uh, reservation because the project that I'm working on is about um, finding your comfort zone with risk and uh, inaccuracy um, and dealing with the fact that we're always going to bake in um, bias no matter what we do, um, at, which goes to that point of amplifying ethical dilemmas. But I think there's also room for really grand visions. Uh, so I guide people to go and have a look at Sarah Kenderdine's work when it starts to come out. Hers is narratives from the long tail. And I think our heritage collections are filled with what we call the long tail. We have some pretty big chunky pieces, but we've got massive long tails. And she's uh, looking at transforming access to audio visual archives, which is not really the terrain of libraries, but I think it's gonna be um, useful. But to the point of collaboration, I think that is, it operates on all those levels that Paul has pointed out. It operates at a personal level. It operates in processes, um, in pipelines, in infrastructure and in the context that we work in. So I really think um, what, uh, what I've discovered very much having come from a community that collaborates heavily, going into a community that's learning to collaborate is that actually when you have the relationships right, a lot of, a lot of the activity works much faster. But there is a, um, there is, a point of translation. So it's lovely to see um, the Paul and Kevin show today because <laughs> it's a kind of, those are the dialogues that you really need to make the collaboration deliver. And that is the meeting of expertise together. So there in one frame on Zoom is, um, without wishing to age people too much, decades of deep and uh, thorough experience with curating and deep and thorough experience with computer science and it's a match made in heaven and I think the difficulty I've had is about trying to close that distance between collecting and technology and I think we've been dogged with this but I think through collaboration we actually keep that dialogue working really well so I think that's a real key for us is to figure out how to embed what we do together through that collaboration into our practices. So we can kind of reach for those visions. The ones that we see now um, being articulated by Kevin and um, implemented through Kia's work at the State Library of Queensland and elsewhere, but also those visions that we can't see, but we kind of instinctively know things are gonna change. So yeah, I think collaboration is fundamental. Agreed. And I think there's something in there about starting with bite-sized projects, certainly through NASLA, um, although it hasn't quite touched on AI yet, those early, um, back to Rachel's five-star um, model, those early sort of tasks of cleaning up data and preparing data for analysis, that's certainly something we uh, have been collaborating on and a, a current project on Indigenous, contemporary Indigenous collections has really revealed um, some of the challenges we've got when we look at our catalogue uh, metadata and try and do some um, overall data analysis with a professional data analyst, back to those partnerships, having another look at how we've been describing collections and the, the consistency or inconsistency of that, that can um, be that tricky first step to get, do the data clean up together and well worth the time, even though it's, it's a hell of a lot of time sometimes to get those materials ready. Rachel, I wanted to direct to you, if and hopefully fairly, just um, because of your work touching on digital preservation, a question from Winston in New Zealand about how we might apply digital preservation to AI. Uh, as he says, in other words, the software and apps, do we harvest all variations and generations of software as they are developed, or do we preserve only finished pieces of software? I think that's an interesting question. And I've been thinking about it in terms of what we've done with Kier's work because he did hundreds of iterations with the machine dreams and 
you know, like Winston is, is saying, they're constantly changing because you're going, oh, these outputs, you know, aren't right. So you're adjusting and modifying. And I think it's almost like, if you think about authors who are doing digital manuscripts now, and it's, it's a constantly changing beast, but I guess it's a decision that you make if you want snapshots of an important moment you want to be able to discuss. Um, I'm sure that our ICT people will be concerned about, you know, how much storage that will take up based on how many versions we decide we want. Um, but I think it's a, it's a, it comes down again to this sort of curation decision, like what is the story that we want to preserve here? Um, because yeah, I think it's never actually finished with AI, especially if it's something that's continu continually used and continually changing. Uh, then we, I mean, I guess the, the easy way would be to set up, you know, at X, on that X point in time, you would take a new snapshot. But I think the cooler way it would be to say, you know, we know some big event happened if, if the software is dealing with people and they're all getting together and using it for something that after that moment, you look at it and compare to how it had changed from before. Um, but it's, it's a tricky question, I think. Mm -hmm. I actually haven't thought about that before because you yeah. haven't done it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. That's the but, sorry, Kev. Can I come in on that one mm, a bit as well? Because I think that's, that's fascinating. In some ways, I'm thinking of AI as the tool rather than the product. Um, and so I think, do I need to preserve the tool any more than I'd need to preserve the pen that wrote the record or the old green screen computer mainframe thing that we used to have 20 something years ago and so on? Um, I think, ah. I'm not so sure, um, but if it's a piece of software we need to interact with um, in order to access something, then yes, everything that we've just said applies. We need to be able to access it, so we need the software applies to it. But we, once we've produced a product, do we still need the tool? And then I thought, actually, what we want to know is the history of how it came together. Um, so the history, what people were assuming, what's the things they've built into it, so as we can understand the records that they've created, and so I, I'm, I was involved in a UNESCO project um, in 2019. Uh, well, involved, I went to a meeting and nodded my head occasionally, but it was about <laughs> archiving source code. And so source code, as they explained to me in this really interesting meeting, was the, um, is the poetry of, of programming. It's the part <laughs> that understands the fundamental part. It's not the executable part. It's the part that describes what the aims and purpose of that software is. So I think with AI, source code would sit there as something that you want to have, and it doesn't take much to preserve source code. It's just a text file. Uh, so you can just stick it in a, like all their other digital data and manage it and so on. But it's with people who understand what source code is for and how it's presented and, and see the poetry, which I admit I do not. Um, maybe Paul can <laughs> add something to that one. Um, can then understand what are the things we put into that AI when we created it so that we can, people in the future will go, why on earth did they do that? And they'll be able to say, all right, that's where, that's where it sits. Mm. Yeah, it does come down to some decisions about what kind of intellectual histories we want to preserve, right? Mm. I mean, media and computer science background, I want to preserve everything because you know, it's an important part of, of uh, computer science journey. You know, we went through the, AI winter, you know, yeah. uh, in, in the 80s and, and the 70s, you know. So I think it, it really gets back to those questions about, well, when you preserve something for the futures, you need to actually anticipate what kind of questions the futures will ask, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you, you, you are doing it from the standpoint of the here and now. Mm -hmm. And in order to, for you to anticipate that futures, you need to imagine what that futures look like. Yeah. And that's very challenging because you, there are so many moving pieces. There are so many things unknown. Yeah. Right. And I wonder if that exactly those sorts of questions about what to collect and what will be of interest in the future and, you know, the poetry of source code, would they fit into Ingrid into the sort of curatorial analytics uh, field of work that you mentioned? So um, I guess um, this is where uh, in a very old and small curatorial hat, I believe software is a publication. So I think it goes into the collecting <laughs> bag. Um, I also think um, uh, we're in uh, a world where having stable objects um, is becoming even less possible. But I think if you look further back, the objects have never been stable anyway. We just are really wrestling with the technology. 
But from a digital preservation point of view, this is where I think automation is going to be really interesting. And also augmentation in the sense that uh, to some degree, um, it would be really nice to understand patterns that um, pop up when you're doing large scale processing of objects so that they don't, those processes don't fail, for example. Um, and to the point about, to Paul's point about errors, you know, to be able to look at where those errors are appearing to help make those decisions. Because, um, you know, errors will pop up with code um, in the way that they pop up with all sorts of objects. So I think it's actually, in some ways, it's the counterpoint to what you can do at scale. It's actually what, can't, what comes out of that process and how comfortable you are with having that amount of error or uh, wanting to spot where the problems are so you can add that into your AI process and improve it. Um, and uh, I'm not familiar with this area, but I understand that optimization is a really big part of AI. And it is what it says on the label. It is about improvement. So I see potential for process improvement in digital preservation and also um, potentially with collecting. Um, I did web archiving years ago. I think there's potential there for AI to help us make determine, well, to determine what it is that we want to keep and also uh, how to maintain that over time. So I'm trying not to get too sci-fi, but I do think there are really <laughs> practical aspects to this. Yeah. Um, but someone needs to give us a really heavy lecture on optimization, I think. Mm, and certainly web archiving is an excellent example of, um, you know, collections at a volume that is just uh, simply unmanageable on human terms. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to, Ingrid, to, um, to, to go back to that, the cartoon of the feelings, you know, the fear and the feelings uh, that arise when we talk about AI in libraries. Um, what, what do you think, what's your advice, I suppose, to um, those making a start in this area in terms of what they can sort of bite off? Um, well, I think, uh, so I thought long and hard about this because I am um, I'm able to get the AstraZeneca jab, which should give you an indication of uh, my vintage. Um, and I've thought long and hard about the colleagues coming in behind me and the colleague, my contemporaries and those ahead of me and what experience we've been having over the last, I don't know how many decades with technology. And um, every time technology shifts, we shift along with it. And there are, there's a dilemma posed, not just in terms of the processes that we undertake, but also where we fit as professionals. And where that's what I started to think about. Why did I gravitate towards this professional development? And um, what would someone else with a different set of interests and a different set of skills in the community, the library community, gravitate towards and why? And um, I, think, um, I think for those out there um, listening, that this is a moment for you to reflect about yourself as a professional and just, I guess, to reinform, re enforce the value of that which you've already got and that it's a perfect scaffold to build other skills on top of and as information professionals um, we are deeply curious about new things and we've shown a lot of strength in um, marshalling technologies and I think it's the fear of the unknown and so the more people track in and you know, get invited to listen to these talks or do a bit of their own exploration and dabble with tools, that fear will subside. But I will warn people, um, I uh, did have a bit of a head on with statistics. It was quite the climb. Um, admittedly, it was a bit of a mountain climb and um, I didn't have much oxygen, um, <laughs> but um, it was doable, um, absolutely doable. So I think it is just the fear of the unknown. And I think we've just um, kind of that thing of you always look at what you can't, you think you can't do, not at all the strengths that you have. And I think we have massive strengths. We just need to be open and um, be willing to potentially shift the way we operate. Yeah. So I would love to see the next generation kind of just knocking over AI. It would really give me great pleasure. Brilliant. And I think um, and I might throw to, to Rachel and Kevin to add to that. It's a lovely kind of end note on Rachel, you never got to go at what your biggest hope uh, is for AI in libraries, but what would you like to see happen next? 
And I think my hope and my fear are sort of all tangled up together. And just listening to what you is saying, I'm just shaking my head yes, because I think the most important thing is that we remember that we are libraries and what our offer is and what our vision is. And, you know, it's about access and it's about, you know, respecting people's privacy. I don't want libraries to move into this space saying, all we're trying to compete with Facebook or Google or like those tech, tech companies have a very different agenda than we do. And we need to be proud of where we're at in the space and make sure that informs our decision-making um, to really stay grounded in that foundation. And I think, you know, the more that, that we've worked it all with machine learning, the more I've realized how human it is at every step, it's human decisions and they aren't necessarily made transparent. So. Um, actually, here I had a conversation with him that I found really interesting where he was talking about um, sort of the sci-fi view of, you know, machine learning and AI sort of taking over the world and how we're afraid of that because we don't understand what it's doing. But then I was saying, actually, like all software development, we should be questioning what it's doing at every stage and we should be afraid of that and saying, you know, we need transparency. And so I think libraries in this space can be really, I feel really like self-righteous right now. I'm like, we are here for the people. So <laughs> I think my hope is that we approach the technology with that same vision and mission in mind. Beautifully said. And Kevin, Paul, give you a chance to have had a rejoinder before we close. Your hopes for AI in the future. I was just furiously nodding through that <laughs> rather than thinking. Um, indeed, I, I, I think that's important to understand what we're here for and, uh, and what we are doing and ensure that the AI we use furthers that aim. But we're going to have to do it differently is what strikes me um, most. Is, um, and it's the, the sorts of products that we'll create using AI are going to be different in some aspect from the products we create as you know, single individuals, you know, real intelligence rather than artificial. And we're going to have to represent them differently. We're going to have to weigh them differently. We're going to have to make them available differently. So it, it's, it requires both a change to what we do, but the change to how people use it and how it's represented. Um, we are uh, Paul talking about the, um, you know, the, the accuracy and what happens if there's a million records and there's 30,000 wrong. Um, if that one, if that 30,000 wrong errors in there, causes you not to find the thing that you needed to find, what does that mean? And certainly modern technology moves us more towards finding lots of things rather than the thing. Mm. Um, and it's those sorts of multiple aspects we've got to build into all the, of the work we do. Um, and I don't know that it's possible, but we certainly have to have those aims and aspirations. Paul? I think yeah. so. Uh, mm. My last word, I guess, is <laughs> humanity is in AI. I think that's... Yeah. Keeping the humanity in the technology. Thank you, yeah, Paul. That's right. Perfect way to end. Um, I would like to thank very much uh, Ingrid, Rachel, Kevin and Paul for giving up your time with us this morning. It's been really wonderful to hear from you and to hear your questions. Thank you to res for responding to all of the Q&As um, and all who are listening. You'll see in the chat there's a few interesting links there to AI for Lamb events and various other bits and pieces. Have a look at that before you log out and uh, keep an eye out for the recording of this session as well on the NASLA website. Thank you again to our wonderful speakers and have a lovely day.